Hey guys and welcome to the fish room. I'm Rachel O'Leary and it's time for a Tuesday tip. Now my Tuesday is extremely busy so I'm going to do some work while I'm talking to you guys. I thought that this week we would talk about shipping in cold weather um, and shipping around the holidays. Now I ship pretty much all year round except for a couple of weeks around Christmas and that's because shipping carriers stop um, guaranteeing their delivery times for about two weeks around the holidays and obviously when shipping livestock you need things to arrive on time or at least in a timely fashion I ship FedEx I ship FedEx overnight or second day a.m. and what I want to talk to you guys about today is heat pack now most of you have probably gotten fish shipped in the mail so you've seen a heat pack inside your package. Um, shipping is an imperfect science. It is, it is not easy to do and there's a lot of thought that has to go into it as well as trial and error. Now, now heat packs are made of iron powder, water, activated carbon, vermiculite, wood powder, and salt. And how they work is once they're exposed to oxygen, a chemical reaction occurs, oxidation occurs, and they produce heat. But what's important to know about heat packs is the actual duration of the heat pack does not always mean it's the best one to use. There are 20 hour, 30 hour, 40 hour, 60 hour, and 72 hour heat packs available. The smaller the heat pack, like the less amount of time that it works, the higher the peak temperature. And that means you can cook fish really quickly if you use too small of a heat pack. Even if you're shipping overnight, that does not mean a 20 hour heat pack is the best bet. In fact, 20 hour heat packs hit a peak temperature of 180 degrees in that first three to four hours. And that is way too hot in a little tiny container. The larger the heat pack gets, the more gradual the curve and the better the consistency with inside the box. So if you guys are going to be shipping livestock in the winter, I really recommend going with a minimum of a 40 hour heat pack, even if shipping overnight. A 40 hour heat pack will hit about 125 degrees in that first four to five hours and then stay around 100 degrees for the duration of the pack. Only dropping off to you know lower temperatures after about 35 hours. And this is why, at least for me, I really recommend overnight shipping in the winter time. It is much easier to predict the curve of a heat pack within that first 24 hours than it is when you go over. There's lots of variables that can affect how a heat pack can work. First is how it's packed within your box. Uh, it obviously requires oxygen in order to work. So what you have to do is make sure that air can get to the stripe on the heat pack in order for it to continue the chemical reaction otherwise they go dormant so if you put them in something like a preformed styro and you close the styro and tape it up once all the oxygen is used from within this styro the heat pack turns off so you have to make sure that you put a hole in it um, and it's not very hard to do. I just use a pen and poke a hole through the preformed styro if that's what I'm using. But what I prefer to do is make my own boxes, especially in the winter time. Because what this does is it means that there's always going to be a little bit of air circulating into the box to allow for the oxidation of the heat pack. Now I use insulating foam um, that I cut to fit for the box. I, and when I'm using heat packs, I tend to pack the fish with a little bit more water and a lot more air. Uh, if they get really hot, you know, there's less available oxygen available, so it's important to really make sure in the winter time that you compensate for that by adding, making sure there's at least two thirds air to one third water in your shipping bag and enough water that if it does get warm, it doesn't get hot. Um, the other thing is I like to wrap my heat pack in a piece of newspaper, putting the red stripe to the interior of the box uh, and taping it to the lid or setting it on top of all my packing materials. And this, you don't want the heat pack to touch the shipping bags, you just want it to be in the box to warm them up. Now if I was using a large box, um, 
like like one of these fish boxes then I would use multiple heat packs uh, the other thing that I do is if there's dead space within the box that I filled with packing materials I will put the heat pack there so it definitely doesn't come in contact with my bags. So if it's really, really profoundly cold, like way below freezing, heat packs can't work at all. So it's important that you can maintain that temperature within the box, that they don't get cold in order for them to keep working. And in, in shipment, often boxes are sitting on airstrips, they're on airplanes, they're in the back of trucks. So there may be a time when it's best to use two heat packs. And in that case, in a smaller box, I really recommend going with the largest heat pack you can find, a 60 hour or a 72 hour. They maintain a constant about 100 degree temperature for almost the whole duration. And now that's not enough to keep things warm enough on their own, but if you mix them with a 40 hour heat pack, you can get a nice flat curve from the large heat pack with a warmer curve from the smaller one. Uh, a consideration about using heat packs as well is that this does add weight to the shipment which can increase the shipping costs. However, I don't feel like they're optional at all in winter months. You have to look at the weather of where you are and where the package is going in order to compensate properly. Now, a lot depends as well on what shipping method you're choosing. If you're shipping um, an express method, where theoretically the packages are to be kept on relatively temperature controlled trucks, insulated trucks, then you can be a little less, you can kind of assume that they won't be sitting outside in the freezing temperatures. If you're shipping something like ground, I really don't recommend that. Um, it's inexpensive, but they're on non-temperature controlled trucks the whole time and it's just really not safe for critters this time of year. Unless you live in a really mild place and are shipping within your own zone. So I'm gonna go catch some fish and then I'll show you how I put the heat packs in the box. Now you guys have seen me package before so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on that. Um, so basically what I do in the winter is very similar to what I do in the summer. And right now I'm going to pack up an order for you. So I've lined my box that has the styrofoam in it with paper. And then I'm going to find a matching order. And then I will take more paper to fill up any empty spots in the box. This also helps uh, prevent the, the bags of fish from shifting any more than they have to and that way hopefully nothing gets stuck in the corners and everybody has a nice safe ride. Now this time of year I try and drop my box, do my boxes later in the day and drop them off as late as I can in the afternoon. That way I can get the most use out of the heat pack. Alright, once my box is nice and full I'll close my internal paper and then you open the heat pack. Now you need to take great care with heat packs that they don't get wet because if they get wet they just turn hard and they don't work at all. So I close up the entire interior of my box first then I open my, my heat pack. You can see one side has a red stripe, one side does not. The red stripe is where you need to make sure that oxygen can, the oxy oxygen exchange can happen. So I take, I like to take piece of paper and wrap my heat pack with the right the red stripe so that it's facing the interior of the box and then I take a lid and I tape the edges of the heat pack so that it stays put within the box and doesn't shift because I don't want it to shift over and touch the larger bag in this box so I do this and by using this foam, it allows for oxygen and air to circulate around the box. So I don't tape every corner because you need that air to get in there. So this should provide a nice, warm, safe environment for the fish to get to their end destination. 
And again, I've told you guys before, I like to use the white boxes and green labels because I feel like anything we can do to bring attention to our boxes as shippers is so that they stick out for careful handling is good. So I always use white boxes and bright labels. Now, if you're using a preformed styro, I have this one loaded with fish already. If I were to close this up and tape it up, there would be absolutely no air exchange in this box, which means as soon as the little air that's in there is used up, the heat pack would just stop working until the box is opened. So, whether it's in cardboard or not, you need to poke some holes, just little ones. I usually do two, just enough to allow some air to get into the box so those heat packs can, can keep working. There's got to be a better tool than a pen for this, but you guys can see how messy my office is right now. Wrap it in paper and tape it to the lid. Making sure, um, sometimes I'll even tape it right over one of the holes, or right next to one of the holes, rather, so that I can make sure it gets that oxygen exchange. And now, I can go ahead and completely seal this styro so that it doesn't come open in transit. So just to recap about heat packs, it's a very simple chemical reaction. The larger the heat pack, the flatter and more consistent the curve, which means the more stability within our box. Short heat packs have an extremely high peak almost incompatible with life and drop off very quickly so their curve looks like this the bigger the heat pack the more flat the curve and the more consistent the heating and it's a good idea if it's profoundly cold to use both a very large heat pack and a shorter acting heat pack to sort of provide that even even curve now for plants you have to be careful not to cook them so you want to make sure you use lots and lots and lots of packing materials if you're using a heat pack with plants. So I hope that helps. Uh, I'm going to get back to the chaos of the fish room and getting these orders out. And I'd like to thank you guys for watching. Now if you followed me on Facebook, you would know that I have been a busy beaver with the hardscape materials. And I hope to soon show you guys a 10 gallon start to finish project. Um, but in the meantime, make sure you stop by my Facebook as well as my website, MsJinx.com, so that you can find my upcoming speaking engagements, my current stock list, and information on all things nano. As always, I appreciate you taking the time to hit that subscribe button, and let me know below if you have any comments, suggestions, or questions.